This episode of Agalia Chats is brought to you by Wolvik, the only open source web browser available for XR devices like Huawei VR Glass, the Oculus and Pico families, and more. Visit wolvik.com to learn more. And if you love the whole idea, please stop by opencollective.com slash Wolvik to lend your support. All right. Hi, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Stephanie Steimack. Welcome, Stephanie. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So I joined Agalia six months ago now, uh, in March of 2024. And I am on the support team at Agalia, which means I basically provide project support. So I'm a project manager for the web platform team. But on top of that, I get to do lots of other cool things. So I do a little bit of like social media marketing for developers for some of our projects. And I even get to do some design stuff. So all sorts of like different stuff that I love to do. And give some talks. Yes. And give talks like <laughs> so many different things. Again, like my ideal job. Nice. What are some of those talks? I've been giving two talks this year. One is not related to what I do at Agalia, but the one that I've been giving that's related to what I do at Agalia has been about funding the web ecosystem, sort of diving into how fragile browsers and web engines are and how much of our infrastructure is held up by open source and how poorly it is funded and just been looking at the the numbers and how much money is generated in that space, but how little of it actually gets funneled back into ensuring it's sustainable and sort of future proof. So I guess it's interesting because you, you historically, you not directly immediately from Microsoft, but like in your fairly recent past, you came from Microsoft mm -hmm. to Agalia and, um, I'm wondering, like, we have not actually had a chance to even talk personally about this, so I don't know the answer. Um, could you compare and contrast? Like, how, how, what's that like? Because Agalia is uh, pretty different, I imagine, than Microsoft. Yes. Having, having never worked at Microsoft myself, but I can imagine. <laughs> well, it's a little bit funny to me because I, when I was at Microsoft, I was hired in as a designer, but my title was program manager, and then it was later changed to product manager but I was still doing design. I was doing developer advocacy and then I was actually doing actual product management on top of that. So it's very similar. And obviously like I was on the browser at Microsoft. I worked on the web platform and then later developer experiences. And so that whole space is similar, but like in terms of the way the company is structured, obviously very, very different because Agalia is a consultancy and we're a co-op. So getting used to the flat structure is like, again, very, very different from Microsoft where you have so many layers of leadership that you need to go through for just like planning purposes and approval to do things. So even though the roles and what I'm working on are similar, I have much more agency to go sort of do what I would like to do without being told no because of whatever restrictions. Right. We see that sometimes in calls where there are representatives from a bunch of different uh, companies, mm -hmm. including us. And, uh, you know, someone will say, I know we all agreed to do this thing, but could we modify it slightly? And Brian and I are literally able to just say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And everyone, almost everyone else has a response of, let me run that by my management or my team or whatever. My, my favorite, um, I guess you could call it a, a symptom of corporate culture is the like responses to email chains. And it'll just be like adding this person and this person. And then all of a sudden you have like three more email replies and it's just adding so-and-so for visibility. Yeah. I mean, sometimes obviously we have to come back. If someone said, I know that we all agreed to put in this amount of money, what would people think about tripling it? Yes, we would have to come back to the collective to get that approval. But like changing the date of an announcement, we could just be completely flexible. 
it takes a little getting used to honestly if you if you switch <laughs> and like in my experience so i i came from like big corporation before and it took me probably six months to get comfortable just in in that part of the role you know to to just be like oh yeah i i see i am empowered to you know within reason and and things like that i'm empowered and encouraged actually to just just go do it you know yeah yeah very cool so you used to work on a browser that had you know enormous corporate backing <laughs> essentially <laughs> right like yes. microsoft you know they have a browser and at one point they had an engine of their own they mm -hmm. do not do that anymore but um they did and now you work for this scrappy co-op that has at least two engines <laughs> yeah. um actually sorry three engines but hold on I, I would like to clarify something when you say three engines what do you mean so there's wolvic which is based on well is based around gecko and now chromium okay so there's kind of two engines there. Um, and then there's Servo, oh, which is interesting. Servo, <laughs> um, which which we're working on a lot. And then um, WP WebKit, which is a fork of WebKit. <clears throat> so I, I guess in a way there's four. Yeah, that's interesting. Because like when you said engines, I think, you know, Chromium, WebKit, and Gecko, right? Those are the three engines. And then now we mix in Servo, you know? So yeah, I miscounted twice. What what does it feel like the 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 support and the your role in relation to those engines? Like how is that different? It kind of goes back to what I was saying about like the like red tape of like corporations and when I was working at Microsoft, even after we switched to Chromium, there is an inherent need for everything to tie back to a business need or business impact. Basically, how is this going to make you money? Mm -hmm. And that's really, really hard with the web platform. And especially because I was so focused on developers, I see all these things that developers want and need to do their jobs. And it's not that Microsoft doesn't care about developers like, of course, they care about developers, and so does Chrome and um, Safari. But when you get into the nitty gritty of business planning, to find funding for web platform features is really difficult. And making a case for features that benefit developers as a subgroup, as opposed to the general consumer audience, mm. was really difficult. And so saying that developers want anchor like anchor positioning for example it's great that they want that but at the end of the day it was like okay how can that benefit the company as a whole like what what is that going to bring us and working on servo even wolvic even though wolvic is based on chromium i well, it's a lot different one because the team is so much smaller but i wouldn't say we're necessarily like gated by business impact we can say we're gonna go do this thing because the engine needs that and go build it right a microsoft engineer many many years ago so this is probably late 90s early 2000s once told me that when they were developing features you know or adding features to the web browser the question they always had to answer was will this make the office team happy Yes, that right. I mean that was that was still true up until I left in 2022. Right. And if the office team didn't want a thing, it didn't happen. We don't have that restriction because I mean for us, yes, some of the things we work on are because a client wants a mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Right. Um some a client might hire us to add a feature. I mean, that's what Bloomberg did for CSS Grid. That's how we got CSS Grid in browsers, basically. It was Bloomberg said, We really want grid in browsers. We're gonna hire a Galia to do it. But we can also say, you know, like you said, it would be really great if we could add this to the developer tools. Mm -hmm. And if that can be internally justified, essentially. It doesn't have the same sort of what money will this make? It's more of a, here is how this would be helpful, both for us, but for the ecosystem as a whole. That often is a winning argument. Yes. I think that there are some examples of this that are 
really obvious to point to that Egalia has been involved with, like Math Mel. Uh, we did some grant work in 2019, and we got a, a few sponsors, but they were relatively small comparatively. Um, and now we have like a collective which allows for individual funding. Yeah, and that actually brings us back around to your talk about the Brasserica system and funding the Brasserica system. Tell us more about the talk. So I will be speaking at State of the Browser, which is in London, a lovely, lovely event uh, that's focused on web standards. So if you are in the general vicinity of London on the 14th, I think there are still tickets available. Um, the 14th of September. Of September, yeah. yes. Yeah. So the talk I'm giving is called Sustainable Futures, Funding the Web Ecosystem. And it's basically a quick a quick dive into the economics of the current state of things and how browsers generate money and the cycle of where that money kind of goes. And it's not all back into the ecosystem. And we're talking about billions and billions of dollars that are being generated from search engines and ads. And the way that it is being funneled back into the ecosystem is not in an equitable or sustainable way. And I think even looking at what's happening with Google right now, I know you just talked about this in your last Agalia Chats episode, but what's happening right now with Google and the antitrust lawsuit in regards to um, search and, and ads, that is actually really, really scary in my opinion when you take a step back and look at the state of the ecosystem, we're, we're in a state where most of the browsers that are out there right now are on Chromium. And Google continues to be the main contributor to Chromium. And so if we're looking at Google losing 65% of their revenue, if they can't pay Apple for that premium search placement, that I think will have more shockwaves across tech than people might realize. Yeah. It is kind of like when you think about infrastructure and how we operate every day, like I certainly can't go throughout the day without accessing the internet or needing to access it to get to my bank statements or my bills or or whatever. And so maybe maybe my view is a little bit too doomsday, but I'm always I tend to be a worst case scenario person. Um, but I think it's an important thing to like plan for, and we really need to start thinking about what happens is, is big tech too big to fail? Is Google too big to fail? Do we really want to perpetuate that? So lots of, I think, philosophical questions too, that arise from this. I mean, you said this actually is scary. Yeah. What's happening with Google? What is it that scares you about that? Again, like the internet is our, and accessing the internet is such a huge part of our modern life. And I think we don't know what's going to happen with Google in this lawsuit, but I imagine if they lose 65% of their revenue, they're going to have to do something and that involves layoffs, that involves reducing the size of teams. I don't know how many engineers they have contributing to Chromium, but again, with Chromium being the the most prominent engine right now, I fear for the web and how it will stagnate if we lose that amount of support for the engine. Well, that's just Chromium because then you have like 100% nearly of Firefox's Mozilla's funding comes from the search deal. And... There's a, a huge, huge check going into Apple from that deal, and a fraction of that pays for the browser. So if you if you interrupt that funding, yeah, it's like, um, you know, we say ecosystem, but it, I think it it's the right analogy, right? Like we're, um, yeah. I was just thinking the the every one of the dollars that Google sends to Mozilla and Apple and to their own browser teams, each dollar is one plankton cell <laughs> right and, and the entire yeah. ecosystem rests on that plankton base and if that suffers a huge population crash or dies entirely what happens to that ecosystem right yep 
I, yeah, I wanted to make a note about something that Stephanie said, you know, about like how much chromium contributes. Cause I know that, you know, we're constantly saying like, oh, you know, Agalia is the number, whatever contributor to this engine and this engine and this engine. And, you know, we talk about other, other contributors, like it will pretty soon we'll be at blink on it. We'll be talking about the diversity of, you know, contributions, who's pulling weight and everything. But, you know, I also like to keep that in perspective that like of all the contributions to Chromium in 2024, I have the number in front of me. I just pulled it up while you were talking. Um, 94.7 of them are from Google and the remaining f roughly 5% is the entire rest of the Chromium ecosystem. <laughs> so that's Intel, Samsung, Egalia, Opera, Microsoft, all of those put together are contributing about 5%. And Google is contributing 94.7% of commits to Chromium. And, you know, lest we think just Chromium has that, um, WebKit is not dissimilar, like in that almost 80% comes from Apple. In Firefox, it's um, about 90% comes from Mozilla. So yeah, between 75 and 90% come from the steward orgs directly. And if they lose all that funding, do those commits continue? I mean, yes, all of those engines are open source. And so hypothetically, they could be continued without their steward organizations contributing those commits. But like you said, Stephanie, it's a stagnation. You can't take 95% of the commits away and even five years later be anywhere close to the kind of advancement rates that we've been seeing recently. Yeah. I mean, another thing that I think, you know, I don't think that everybody realizes, but, you know, browsers have security patches and bit rot with changes to operating systems and drivers and things like that. So like just keeping a secure browser safe and, and secure and running with your operating system changes and everything like costs a non-trivial amount of money, like without adding anything. And we do have some experience with moving an engine forward, a servo. Mm -hmm. You've actually been doing something really cool, I think, which is a sort of a servo weekly notes of the, like, here's what, got added to Servo or what changed in Servo this week. What, how has that felt? I'm just curious. So it's been good. I, I, I do want to give a shout out to um, Zach. I, yeah. why can't I remember his full name? Weatherman. Yeah. yeah, I saw him doing this for 11T and I was like, oh, I thought, you know what? That might be cool to do for Servo. The only thing is like, I'm only capturing like, a very, very small portion of what is actually happening weekly because the team at Egalia that is working on Servo is very a huge part of pushing the engine forward, but there is quite a bit of community involvement. And so it's actually been really cool to go through and see not just the layout work that's happening, like they just turned on Flexbox by default in Servo, which is huge. But there's someone in the community who has been working on WebXR and slowly like enabling WebXR in Servo. And mm. this has been really interesting for me to witness too, because of, like I work on Wolvic, which is our XR browser. Mm -hmm. And so I've had sort of three different projects intersect because I have another client in the IFPS space who saw the Servo WebXR work happening and then was like, oh, well, what if we created an XR browser based on Servo and then had this other specific requirement with something called Web Tiles? And, and so it was like kind of a neat moment to see these organic conversations about three projects that I'm involved with just evolve in discord and then you have people in the webxr discord saying oh well what if we put wolvic on servo like this is completely unprompted by anyone at agalia but actual community folks talking about what if this happened or what if we did this and it's been really cool and i think the highlights have been a really good way to sort of bubble up the other work that's happening that isn't just agalia 
Yeah, shout out to uh, Daniel Adams from Hawaii, who is the one who did that uh, M sub two on GitHub. So yeah, that's really that's really cool, and uh, it is a little bit harder for me to classify the commits in Cero, but it looks to me like uh, around forty five to fifty percent of commits to Servo are coming from Egalia. So that's like much more diverse. I mean, it's a it's a smaller engine much smaller team so it's easier to get 50 percent of that i guess but yeah it's it's more diverse and also um i think it's still not a ton of money but the collective has uh a couple hundred regular contributors which is an interesting thing on its own and it leads me to want to talk about you know what your talk is about the funding and describing the problem is half of it but what to do about the problem is the is the kind of other half, right? Like and we could talk about, okay, we have to agree that climate change is happening. That that's only half of it though. Then well, what what do we do about it? It's the other half mm -hmm. and arguably the more important half in a way. Uh, so I want to circle back for a minute, and it, this relates to funding, but I think people would be surprised to hear that even at Microsoft, which is the company with billions of dollars it working on the web engine and the web platform there has a similarity that i see in like servo and wolvic in that it was actually really hard to get funding for work on the web platform and the engine side of things which is absolutely baffling to me um because i feel like without the web engine you don't have the browser and without the browser, you don't have Bing, which is where all that money is coming in. The difference, however, between that situation and then like Servo and Wolvik is both of these projects like need stable funding to keep existing. So that puts more pressure on like those projects and making sure that they are solving needs for people, whereas at Microsoft, it's like the, I don't like they're not going to let the browser die. They just switched engines to make it easier to maintain and is all like honestly more cost effective to switch to Chromium for them. Yeah, but it it is fascinating to me, like on that base level of just why is it so hard to fund a web engine? I think that. uh 2004 is the culprit. I believe that that's when the uh, initial. So um, the the plan originally was to sell a browser, right? So to give it away for free, but then you sell it with some extras to corporations. You sell licensing. Um, everything was shrimp, shrink wrapped up to that point, and pretty much that was the idea. But then Microsoft saw that it was getting away from them and they went all in on developing their own internet explorer and it killed Netscape's business model. So this was like the birth of open source and it got, you know, its initial funding through some generous grants initially, I think from just a few individuals who had really a lot of money. And this is also the time that Google search was being born and this, you know, kind of a marriage made in heaven for it seemed at the time right like we'll give you money to send search requests our way and to begin this whole like integrated search default home screen you know default search deal um so once that happened that's the way we fund things and to consumers to the average everyday person it appears to have no cost right so I compare this a lot. I don't know, maybe people who listen to this podcast are tired of hearing the same couple of stories from me, but like I compare this to like my grandmother who grew up with just broadcast TV and a million commercials. And when we started paying for cable when I was a kid, she said, why well, are you crazy? Like television is free. Why would you pay for it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yeah. And then, you know, we had like pay channels, like HBO or whatever. And we thought that was great because it was like, hey, there's no commercials at all. It's it's amazing. And you know, she thought that was just bonkers. Why would you why would you do such a thing? Uh that's where we're at right now with the web, I think. It's like 
we need to explore other models of funding because by and large, the public thinks it's free, but it's not. You have an advertising tax and actually the tax is quite high in my opinion. Like you get just absolutely inundated and tracked and you know, there's so many problems with the current model, the way the money is coming in. It's like the broken bits of the crumbs that weren't swept up by the vacuum cleaner that fell off the ad table that funds everything. Like it's such a tiny fraction that funds everything. And, you know, we need other ways to do that, I guess. So, I mean, it doesn't surprise me because everybody thinks it's free, right? But mm -hmm. it's not. And it's all a matter of perspective. Like on the one hand, we have the, you know, Apple, Google, Mozilla there and Microsoft. Historically, I think of them like the Avengers, you know what I mean? Like they're there to champion the web and save the web and everything. But also, are they? Yeah, I think the problem of funding is interesting. And I, I've been thinking about it the last week as I get ready to update this talk um, for State of the Browser. Um, just thinking about different ways to get people thinking about it and encourage maybe even companies that they work for to establish some sort of grant or fund, or even like, where are where's the government funding? For this like if the internet is such critical infrastructure and browsers are such critical infrastructure where is the government funding yeah absolutely i think that's been a point that i've had for a while is that you know there are grants and things this is actually in the past couple of years governments around the world have started to do some things like there's uh nlnet i think it gets their mm -hmm. their funding through government things and we have a few things that we've submitted and and got grants from NLNet, but also like the White House recently ma made a statement about like the, the future of computing needs to be safe and, and like built in memory safe languages. And I think like Servo is that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, great. Here's where you can send the check. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we could use the funding, honestly. Um, and I don't think it needs to be like any well, I don't know what it needs to be, but, you know, I think the point is that there is a levy that needs to be paid by everybody somehow. And like every other kind of levy, it isn't everyone, right? Like we need to find a way to spread it across so that sort of like the people who can afford pay in a way that probably at the end of the day feels similarly free, but ultimately isn't, you know, like the roads, we think they're free, but they're not, right? Uh, so speaking of things that like we think are free but aren't free, I came across a search engine that you can pay for and basically you don't get overwhelmed with ads and, and whatnot. I think it was like $10 a month. Um, I didn't look that much further into it, but I thought that was interesting. And I wonder, I wonder how many people would actually be interested in doing that I feel like a lot of general consumers like I'm just thinking of like my mother I'm like if I told her she had to pay to search the internet she'd probably be like why <laughs> yeah then, I mean she would have the same reaction as my grandmother right like why yeah. would you why would you pay for television right why would you pay for a search engine um why would you pay for a browser yeah um, or the I think the thing that has been difficult for us to fight and part of why we started our open prioritization experiment where we did was because I know for me, like, okay, the idea that I could or that other smaller companies could somehow even begin to discuss, like, how can we either fund a feature directly or like pool our money to fund a feature was like that's messed up. Google and Apple are like Stuart and Microsoft. They're like the stewards of the web and they have all the money in the world. Like they're at the top of all of the, <laughs> all the economic scales, you know, like why, mm -hmm. why shouldn't they pay? They should pay. And it's like, well, but why? Like, <laughs> like I, I get that, but I don't know. A Amazon makes all the money in the world too. And they don't currently pay really anything into, into this, you know? um comparatively like it's it's peanuts that they pay compared to google 
then there's, you know, Microsoft is peanuts compared to Google. Like we just said, like it's a tiny, tiny fraction now of what they commit to Chromium. Mm -hmm. It's not a judgment, but that's, you can see that the way that we've set up the model, it encourages taking more than giving. And yep. ultimately we're coalescing all of the giving into basically Google at the end of the day. And something I have been claiming for some time, like we'll eventually disrupt that, you know? And, and so like the purpose of our initial open prioritization experiment was just to start this conversation because it's, I think traditionally we think just like you said, yeah, they should pay, you know, like why, why should I pay? I shouldn't pay. And I still think I couldn't pay like viscerally, yeah. you know? <laughs> But I do, you know, like I actually have several of these collectives that I give money to every month and I, I don't notice it. I know, but there, there have been like a number of experiments, like this search thing that you mentioned that maybe also will help turn the conversation. And I'm just curious, like, can we talk about some of them? Like, I don't know how many you know about, but the, the search one was big on Hacker News for a little while. I don't mm -hmm. know what happened with it. I, I don't use it. Um, do you remember what it's called? I don't. But we like we had uh what was his name from Polypane? Killian. Killian. Killian, right. Killian. We had him on and I think Polypane is like ask you for money kind of browser, right? Like cuz it's for developers and he needs to get paid, you know. So that that's a model. I don't know how scalable it is, but Polypane is just the browser part and it's like really pretty much a one person effort you know so it's like um you definitely shouldn't use it as your daily driver because you know like probably like security wise and stuff like that is not great <laughs> you know yeah. um it, it doesn't get updates like edge or chrome or safari stuff like that you know in the same way but it's an interesting model i don't know how much it brings in um i don't know how popular it is um but you can see a reason like that. Like, I think the part, the interesting thing about that experiment is that Killian observed like, well, like maybe if I do something really interesting and novel for developers, developers would pay for that. And developers typically make an okay living so they could afford to give you some money and maybe they would be willing to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting, like to target a niche thing, but... I, I have to wonder, even when we talk to him, if those things are really super useful, will like Chromium put them in dev tools and then people won't pay for them? Yeah. Like what are the incentives and disincentives? Because it's like maybe it's if if you could get money in that way, which I don't I don't think you probably can get enough money in that way, but if you could get money in that way and somehow funnel it back to Chromium or or a good portion of it you know like that's the trick is we need to get money to move downstream i think is is the real the real issue here yeah um because then, at the end of the day that the engine has no business model talking about like getting paid um by a browser i know some like edge pays me and to search and i a lot of people i don't think know that um because that came up in that came up in our breakout session at Web Engines Hackfest in June, and every time I search on Bing, I get a certain amount of points, and then I can then redeem that for gift cards, or I could even donate to a charity with it. Um, but Edge has also had this push recently to be like a shopping browser, and as much as I want to hate it. I've gotten like $70 cash back from using Microsoft Edge, which is bonkers to me. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's another thing that like Brave experimented with. Um, I like early on got Brave and I hooked it up and, you know, their thing was like, we'll pay you. Um, now it's like paid in their own, it, you know, it's it's like your um, like your points. You know, it's interesting that they're they're basically very similar. Um, Microsoft's points are like a fictional kind of money that exists in Microsoft browser land, mm -hmm. and and Braves are too. But Braves are bat, and they're um, 
crypto, right? And I I personally have like a mm, yuck <laughs> for that, you know. Uh, but they're the same in a way, right? But um, anyway, Brave also did that, and yeah, I I earned I don't know one hundred fifty dollars from using Brave. Weird, <laughs> it's weird, right? But that is exactly the the kind of thing that shows you like how the money what what the money is worth. And uh, the interesting thing about um, the interesting thing about that is with Brave, I was able to like put it back into a cycle. So like I could say, okay, so take at least five dollars a month of whatever I'm earning or whatever, use that to pay creators. So take that uh, a portion of that money every month and put it toward creators. And so like I could create a I could create a closed loop and maybe my browsing is ultimately worth five or ten dollars a month, whatever whatever it's worth. And I can just say, yeah, that's fine. Like put it and use it to pay creators. And then it's like this weird, very efficient cycle, you know, what is kind of a cool idea. Like, um, well, I, I could have a do a whole other podcast, I think, on like the state of web content and social media, just based on that comment about like paying creators, because um, I've been thinking a lot about the old the old Internet lately. But that is a whole other conversation. Um, I mean, they're highly related, right? Yeah. Um, so what makes what makes the web very interesting is content. You know, so yeah. we need people to create the content. And if you want to get really high quality content, you want people who can do it professionally and, you know, it costs money. So you have to pay them. But who's paying them? And there are some examples of really successful people who did that, who mm -hmm. make like mind boggling amounts of money. Right. Like to me, like, wait, you're an influencer how much you make how much money you know like that's wow um yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. like a very fringe uh, a number of people who are successful like that and for everybody else it's like hard to make anything you know mm -hmm. um yeah anyway back to the like um if i can pivot back to like the experiments um uh, and and things that are happening in in this area, like we mentioned, polypain. We also had on Andreas from Ladybird, and and they got money, like they're getting money from some organizations to fund that work. That's kind of uh, interesting. It's similar to Servo, don't you think? Well, yeah, and this is something because obviously I've been following what's going on with Ladybird and looking at how much they're getting in sponsorships and the eternal question that I keep coming back to is is it just marketing is it because it's labeled as a browser and not a web rendering engine like servo is what is the magic sauce that is funneling money towards that project I'm pretty sure on their website too it says they won't have a browser until like 2026. And I look at Servo and I'm like, well, we've got a mini browser. Yeah. You know, I've had some, a, a few conversations, uh, even with Andreas, just like messages here and there about, you know, discussing this because it's like, it's not much more than mini browser, right? I mean, I don't think that people give a lot of thought to that, right? I mean, some people who use like maybe Vivaldi or something like that give a lot of thought to what's in their browser. I don't know. For a lot of people, like everybody in my family, probably how much more than a mini browser do you need to be called a browser? You know, mm -hmm. uh, so the servo mini browser has tabs. It has a URL bar and it has a default page. And should you use it as your daily driver? No, <laughs> you should not. It's not ready for that. Should you, can you use Ladybird? No, same. It's not. It's also not ready, and um, it's harder, in fact, to use than Servo because Servo provides binaries nightly, and you you would have to get it and compile, at least at this point, Ladybird yourself. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, I mean, serval is available on like uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, right? I don't know. Is it on Android yet? I don't think it is. No, there was still some work yeah. being being done for Android. Did you see, I'm sure you did see <laughs> recently the Verso, somebody from the servo community created a repository and they got very close to a thousand, I think, uh, points on Hacker News. And, you know, I went and looked because Servo always is exciting in a way. It gets a lot of attention. Almost everything for Servo has gotten not anywhere near that attention. Like, there's only one thing that ever got more attention in relation to Servo. Only one in the entire history of Servo. And this Verso was literally a GitHub repository. Like, it, it was not more than the mini browser, really. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was a little less than the mini browser and it got all kinds of attention. And I think it is really because the distinction of, Hey, but it's a browser. And I wonder why, I wonder if people think like, well, I can't like, it is an interesting point. Like I can't just pick up and use the engine. I need a way to use it. Right. Yeah. You know, but, but you can browse, you can browse Hacker News while drinking your coffee on it. I Absolutely. That. Yeah. You can play on it. And you can report bugs and you can find something that needs to be done and go, hey, I'm going to do that. Even with the mini browser, you can say like, you know what this would make this so much better is these, you know, read a read later list or a reader mode. I, I miss reader mode. Like you, you can send a pull request for that and or you can make a downstream browser or something, you know, like it's fun, I think. Um, it It is fun. And I wonder, I... Well, first off, I should probably try and build Servo on my machine. I have not tried to do that yet. But I know, like, I am frequently on the browser subreddit, <laughs> um, perusing, like, what people are talking about. And people are always asking for, like, you know, what's the best browser for this? But then there is a subgroup of users who post their browser projects that they've built and there's someone on there who just built this browser called zen and has generated like quite a bit of discussion around their browser side project on that subreddit and people are interested in like downloading it and trying it and I feel like there was a time when I used to want to try different browsers and maybe it's because I started working on a browser and had every every version of canary and dev and all the the preview ones and i just don't find myself switching between browsers that often anymore but there is like a subgroup of people who are like like they they just want to try all the different browsers even if it's some indie project and they get really excited about it yeah, I think we need like a diversity of experiments and diversity of ways to to fund things. Like um I think there are lots of incentives for people to fund things upstream that they're not sort of paying attention to. I think that people have a lot more power than they realize. Like um you know, Agalia is working on SVG, a whole SVG engine rewrite for WebKit. We've been working on it for a long time. And, you know, lots of bugs would just disappear. Mm -hmm. We're also interested in getting that community moving again because there's more to do. You know, it's not it's not finished. Like SVG is not a done product. There's lots of wants and desires out of SVG, but nobody's funding the work. How many things use SVG? Like all those companies, if they pool their money and we come up with ways to collectively decide how to prioritize that money. Mm -hmm. Wow, that could be huge yeah and that's one thing that i love about working on servo too is typically there is a collective decision that happens around how they're going to spend the money that is donated via open collective so they meet with the technical steering committee and folks join that call it's open it's typically once a month and they collectively decide what they're gonna spend that money on and i'm not sure if it's landed yet i have to check but if the most recent thing that the money was used for was um 
Windows CI runners. In case anyone's wondering, like, well, how does that collective bit work? Like, it can happen and does happen and is effective in, like, deciding how money gets spent. Yeah, I like the diversity of investment in Servo. There's hundreds of people contributing to that individually. Not much on the businesses. We could use more of that mm -hmm. because um, you need a really lot of people giving small amounts of money. Like it works with something like a browser or search because it's just wild amounts of users, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you have maybe 200, 300 people donating small amounts of money, it's 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 not enough. And what we saw was like, you know, one company came in and said, okay, we'll match $10,000. And somebody else came in and said, okay, we'll give $10,000 to whichever one wins. And, you know, those two contributions were like more, you know, more than all the other ones combined. So we need some business support in there, I think. Yeah. And I think there are good reasons to do it. Um, all kinds of interesting things that we, that you can do with it. Maybe that's a way we can, we can get some businesses interested if you're building an embedded system, maybe it's worth making sure that it has the things that you need. So sponsor it. Absolutely. Seems like a good plan. Obviously, when it comes to funding Servo and Wolvik and like everything that I work on at Agalia, like I'm the PM for MathML. Um, I, I think about where the money's coming from. How can we get more money? And I'm not like I didn't go to school for marketing. And I think one of the things that I struggle with is seeing so much money spent, like, this is really, really stupid, but I saw a an article recently and it was like someone profiling Tom Brady and this NFT company that he either founded or invested in. And well, there's a part of me that just sort of dies when I see that because I'm like, I fear that so much of tech is backed by investors who are looking for a return on their investment. Like when, a giant return too, right? Yeah. And yeah. so when we talk about funding the platform or funding these projects, I fear that a lot of people are turned off because I won't get a return on investment like for, for themselves. And it's, Really like to, I just find it frustrating, and I wish people could sort of see the bigger picture. And that you may not get a monetary return on investment or get thousands of dollars back or millions, whatever. But at the end of the day, you are investing in a way that ensures that technology can continue to evolve and potentially lead to other things that can bring you money. But there's this base level of the platform and, and tech and the web that is incredibly fragile. And I wish more people, more businesses especially, would invest and hire people like Agalia to continue to ensure that the platform is stable and sustainable. Because if not in true, like worst case scenario sense, one day that platform will collapse and I fear for the absolute chaos that will cause. Yeah, definitely with all of these things, I think that there is a, I think that actually the thing that started the web ecosystem health was a comment by Jeremy Keith when he was talking about like political parties. I think the same thing is relevant here. So like how many web engines should you have? Zero is the wrong answer. <laughs> One is a better answer, but it's still a bad answer. Mm -hmm. Two is a better answer. Three, right? Like, but we need ways to fund these things, you know? So it's tricky. How do we, how do we do this? So, yeah, I think it's super important to have the diversity. Um, super important that it is there at all because, you know, moving to a completely new paradigm, it's entirely possible that people would try to change the paradigm and be like, you know what? That web thing was good, but not anymore eric do you want to throw anything out there or no i think i think uh, it's been a really good conversation and really appreciate uh that you joined us thanks stephanie yeah i actually 
quick funny story before we close out. I have an email from 2022. So right when I left Microsoft, y'all invited me on to Egalia Chats. And I don't think it happened because my life got super chaotic. Two years later. (laughs) Here we are. (laughs) So glad that we could finally have you on. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.